Hello, Husker fans. We're back with another week of the Pick 6 Podcast. Two of the three heavy hitters are here. I'm here with Tom Chattel. Dirk is out on assignment. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we just had signing day, Tom. It's good to good to talk to you. Good to see you. Yeah, it saw did, you yesterday. It didn't feel like signing day. It feels no. like it feels like transfer day now. It feels like uh, we 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 update um, because there's a signing day in uh, December that seems to carry more weight, or it does carry more weight, and then and then we have transfers um, up 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 in mid January. It seems like it's just sort of an afterthought now, and uh, it's more of like a um, yesterday was, was sort of a housekeeping um, thing where we asked questions about the whole program and some of the guys, and, but the quarterback room and and all that stuff. So, yeah, I thought it was great. Um, but it's amazing to me, you know, Tom Osborne used to walk in and in his in his own way to avoid asking answering questions, he would read off every player they signed. His bio. He was talking about every player. If they'd signed twenty four guys, he'd go twenty four. And it would take about a half hour. Well, that's about all the time we got. Thank you. Any questions? I that's all we got. You know, he did that brilliantly. Um but signing that used to be about the guys you signed and the hope and you know, the hope and the dreams. The high school, we'd go to the high schools and February now is almost like We've already done that before. So, I think if you win games in a consistent basis, signing day becomes more about the players, right? Like we 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 have we have basically signing day has turned into and what and what thing that we don't know anything about do we have to ask about because we have a new coach or we have a weird situation where the where you know Scott just hired an offensive coordinator and we didn't know what was going to happen like that's. Signing day in Nebraska has now become drama day. And it's not dramatic with, with rule, but it's become this day where you basically ask a bunch of questions about guys he's hired or, you know, players that he's welcomed back because because they don't win games and so like we don't have a lot of time to shift right. our focus I, I guess to true. the recruits. You, but it's also the, the second signing day. And so there you know, there are a few guys you really wanted who didn't sign early, but most of the guys you wanted, um, are, are, are in, in the fold. Already in the fold. And I would argue that, you know, when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the sugar high, the best candy now are the, the transfers. People love their immediate guys. And, and quite frankly, some of them come with baggage. Some of them are not damaged goods, but they're, they transfer. There's a reason they transfer. The um, reason they weren't playing. Um, but maybe in, in your situation, they're going to play and they're going to they're going to contribute. So that's why it's such a uh, the transfer thing is is very powerful for fans, um, and I suppose us too, because you can look at it and go, okay, they just got a center from Arizona State. They did they have a center? You know, um, no, they didn't. That was that line, was a great addition. Offensive line. I mean, guy from Georgia. Okay, well, I think I was a four star, whatever, uh, five yeah, star he, tight end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all the stars, whatever. Um, all the stars weren't getting him on the field, but but Georgia, you think okay, because they got a guy last year from Alabama, and he didn't do much, as I recall. Stephon um, Wynn, he you know he okay, he came on as the season went on. Yeah, but he was he was he remember, was a contributor. I remember thinking all, wasn't August, as good as Colton Feast well, or Ty Robinson. Well, no. There you go. He was so, okay, though. And he's back. He's back. But I'm just saying, and maybe some of that is coaching. But I'll, but I'm just saying, you think, we expect the Alabama guy to come in here and just tear up the room. Right. Like like Alex Karras and uh, uh, Blazing Saddles. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, holding back the piano. Um, yeah. But he, uh, he didn't. And so that's okay. But – but we got Trey Palmer. Every bit as good or better than it w- anybody expected. Um, oh, better! Yeah. And Casey Thompson, pretty uh, good. Very. Yeah, I think he was the real deal. Yeah. Uh, Warrior showed up, played hurt, a leader, all that stuff. Um, and you know, I think they need to get better at the position. And I think they went out and got Jeff Sims because they think they can get better. Uh, Whether they do or not, I don't know. 
But I think Casey was pretty good. I think I think they've got to get better there. Right. Um, and they could stand to get better around Casey, but there were things. There were certainly things that, you know, and the other thing with Casey is that he gets hurt. And we'll talk about the quarterbacks in a minute. Yeah. Um, so we, we go to the press conference yesterday. He talks a little bit about transfers. The thing that jumps out to me about about Matt is that I, I it really does feel like he is um, a true CEO head coach. I was just going to say that and yeah, because of how he started. Do you, do you recall how we started the press conference? I do. I thought that was fascinating um, for people who didn't uh, hear it or see it. Um, he started like, well, yeah, before we started here, I have a few, a few items, almost like housekeeping items. He wanted to talk about the uh, Nebraska Women's Day and, and, and how great it is to honor the women uh, athletes. And um, he went to see the tennis and, and, and so on and so forth. He, then he wanted to uh, congratulate the former Huskers in the Super Bowl, and he named them all. He said he'd been texting with uh, Dominic and Sue. And uh, there was a third item. I can't remember what it was, but that's what a CEO does. Yeah. Okay. You know, he reads off the. He, you know, I'm in charge. I want. You know, I, I didn't make a statement about certain things. We need to tie it all together. But it's all. This is all under the umbrella of of me and the program. And um, I thought that was cool. Mm-hmm. I just did. I thought. Instead of getting up there and going, well, anybody have questions or, you know. Well, Scott would walk up and put his hands in his pockets and just wait for us to ask a question. It's And that's who he was. and that's, That is who he was. That's fine. Mike Riley did the opening statement. I think Nebraska's a big enough program, big enough brand, big enough to the state, of the, uh, the people, that you need a CEO. You need a guy who's going to act like this is important and I'm in charge of it. Hmm. And that, and um in any leadership, and that's a little thing. You know, there's a long way to prove uh, Matt Rule's leadership, but the, the way uh, he started has there have been a lot of good signs, and they've won the off season again, haven't they? Do you like the, <laughs> Do you like a CEO head coach? I do, I do, um, because th- that's what you want somebody that has a ha- that knows what's going on everywhere, um, because. You know, assistant coaches are very valuable, and a lot of times you're only as good as, as the uh, your coaching staff. But you know, the guy needs to know a little bit about how to how to how to fix everything and mm-hmm. and um, be on top of everything. Absolutely, um, he, he, he you need to know where you're going, not just where you've been, but where you're going and how are we going to get there. That's the CEO. So Matt Rule has had the experience of working at um, UCLA, Western Carolina, Temple, the New York Giants. Then he became a head coach at Temple, Baylor, Carolina, and now Nebraska. If you look at the the span of his coaching career, and I think that the experience in Western Carolina is more important than people give it credit for. He has he has worked at nearly every level uh, outside of high school, and he's worked a lot of different kinds of jobs. And like when you're an assistant at Western Carolina, there's stuff you got to do that you will never do if you are the head coach at Nebraska. Yeah. But it's valuable when you say he has to know a little bit about everything. My sense is that he's had to do just about every little job that you could imagine within a football program outside of high school. You know, and there's stuff in high school about whatever right. that he probably didn't deal with. And so there's there's a certain um, knowledge base there of kind of having done you know been there and done that. Mike Riley had that too. Right, He had worked literally every job you could imagine. However, and I think this is what's different between Riley as a CEO, and I don't think he was a very good one, and Rule as a CEO. The difference between them is I always felt like Riley had 100 people around him, and they all had an idea, and Riley didn't know how to say no. Right. He never knew how to say no. He could not control um, the, the environment very well. I think with Matt Rule, you know, the oldest coach on his staff, is 52, and that's Ed Foley. All of his staff people, if you look at like his general manager and his personal assistant, who's a former cop, it's an interesting story, and then the director of operations, who's like comes from Texas high schools, none of them know more about Nebraska than he does. Right. Most of his, and he said he has 14 people who used to play or coach for him in his department. It's very clear to me in a short amount of time 
that Matt Rule is is nothing gets added or subtracted or sprinkled onto the meal without him knowing what it is. Right. And I they, like that. they all run it by him. That's I mean the tall redhead who used to be the same operate the same way. And, you know, uh nothing happened without Tom Osborne knowing about it. And he was extremely hands on. And um so I like it. I love it. I think it's it's the way you want it. It's uh, I was that way, right? Kirk Ferentz is that way. Um, Boy, is he. The we'll, best talk about, co- we'll talk about them. The best there. coaches are that way, yeah. and uh, whether they act like it or not, um, that's what they. That, that, that's how it operates, and that's what you need. Uh, you know, Scott Frost had that background too, Sam. He he was the guy who coached defense, Northern Iowa, coached a little bit of here, coached a little bit of there, coached under everybody. Right. Um, should have had a. A, a, no, a thick notebook of how to do this, but fell in love with the play calling. That's right. Along the way, deep down, he could have been a great CEO, probably, because um, he played under great CEOs. Right. But he, you know, Bill Walsh, uh, Chip Kelly, these guys that fall in love with the plays, mm-hmm. and that's okay. But um, it was something to work for Bill Walsh, um, and it worked for Chip Kelly, but. Didn't work here. And so, um, yeah, I, so just because you have the resume and you did all the all the, uh, the, the, the the little things doesn't mean you grew up to be that guy. You have to embrace the role of the CEO. And I think I think uh, I think Matt Rule has. And that's what we see a little bit more. Every time we talk to him, he gives us a little bit more. He shows, a, you know, Shines the light a little bit more on every on the on that aspect. So, um, again, these are all great things. I can't wait to see him on the field mm. because I know the attention to detail here is is outstanding so far. Um, you gotta, I want to see it on the field. One of the Frost former coaches told me that you know Scott was working on the CEO stuff. Obviously, Trev Alberts wanted him to be more of that kind of coach. Yeah. But one of the challenges, especially early in Frost's tenure, is that you know he would be busy doing all the things that a, that a major head college football coach has to do, and then he would have to come back in to an offensive installation meeting later in the week, and you know there would have to be like a... They'd have to catch him up because he was the one calling the blaze. Yeah. And so that level of, you know, um, now I think Matt Rule is going to be, you know, involved in the planning on the offensive and the defensive side of the ball. Rare coach who's been basically coordinated two different kinds um, of teams. And so I think, you know, Matt knows a lot about all of it. But can he kind of stand outside of it? I think that's something he can do. The other thing that I, that I would say is that I was just struck uh, Wednesday about some of the items that he ticked off. They were sort of hidden. But one of the things he said, for example, is I asked my coordinators to rank their playmakers, and then I asked them, you know, how they're getting them the ball. Um, another, if if the special teams has nothing but walk-ons, then that's a team where the starters don't understand the value of special teams. Right. Another, from Ed Foley, Coach Rule is okay with with a guy being on one special team so long as he doesn't. So you there's a there is a framework for a lot of this stuff. In other words, I want this. I want my starters on the kickoff team. But they're not going to play core four. Spe- they're not going to be core four special teams unless they have certain so many snaps. You can hear how the framework of how they want to play football, or this idea of now this is kind of obvious, but you know when we score, we want to get a stop. Now obviously, but what you need to remind your defense of is this is one of those moments that after we get a score, we have an opportunity to get a stop and then go get another score, and the game's completely flipped. Right. Scott was always about let's score. And if they score, we're going to outscore them. Right. We're going to be if we beat them fifty-two to forty-two, we're fine. Complimentary. Yes. So there's a complimentary aspect to what Rule's talking about: the yes. idea that you don't mm-hmm. just want to teach the kids the plays, but you want to teach them how to win football games. But I, I love this, and I, I think it's it's a staff that we haven't seen this. Uh, you know, yes, Mike Rowley and his staff had been together, but I didn't hear this from them. I didn't hear a, a philosophy, a plan in place. Um, I mean, not like this. No, no, that's absolutely to true. This, to, You're very right. To this attention to the... Not uh, even uh, close. To, to the, uh, the detail. And they all they all know it by heart. And so, you know, 
you go down the list, the uh, Callahan staff was Callahan was a little bit more like Rule. A little bit more. There was like a more it. of yeah. a, there was a plan there. He's the play caller guy. He was. Um, um, I don't. For example, I don't know that Matt Rule, if he had taken the job in 04, would have done a hell of a lot better than Bill. And that's not a knock on Matt. The job that Callahan took over was a nightmare. Yeah. Because he took over a, a, a program that didn't want him to be there. Right. And he was running an offense that did not jibe at all with the talent that was on the program. And what? so I, I I feel like the longer that we get into this losing era of Nebraska football, the more empathy I have for Bill Callahan and for what? Bo Pelini. I was going to ask, what if... What, I have empathy for both of them. What if Matt Rule's first four years are like Callahan? People will be okay with it. Two bowl games and, and then two years of no. People would like it a yeah, lot. Yeah, I think it's – timing's everything. Yeah. Um, I think that's true. Yeah, people um, would be okay with it. But – But, I mean, we have more but, appreciation for Bo now. But, I mean, but, my goodness, he won nine games. Right, but he wasn't going out to every high school. The, no, he wasn't. This is the thing – you give yourself room. You give yourself a runway. Uh, you know, you build your own runway by the, the goodwill things, mm-hmm. um, the – you know, putting yourself into the culture, into the state. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm mixing it up with everybody. Uh, uh, breaking bread at the the, uh, the the 50s diner in Grand Island. I mean, that kind of stuff. It's 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 uh, what Nebraska is all about at its heart and soul. Um, so, I'll say this: that the yeah. biggest challenge I think that he has is not the stuff that he's been doing for the last two months. Even though I think they've done a good job with that, I think other coaches have done good jobs at times. And this is where I will I will give sort of a half praise to Bo Pelini because I'm still trying to work through it as a person who's covered this program for a long time. I think there's something about when Nebraska guys get here, getting them to perform up to their talent level, like motivate them and, and get them to perform beyond, you know, mediocrity, and to work through, I think Nebraska athletes. I know we feel like they're not they're, they're not paid like coaches, but I think Nebraska athletes are treated quite well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just do, and I think sometimes it can get a little comfortable at Nebraska. And and I think it it, it, it got Riley and it got Frost a little bit. I think Frost is more of a players' well, coach, and he's not. The point that yeah. I'm making is Bo Pelini had an ability, even if I don't like the means by which he always used it, which was threats and fear and pitting people against each other, you know, tribalism. He had a way of getting players to 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 play up to and at times exceed their ability level. And I don't know that any other head coach since Frank Solich, and I'm not sure Frank Solich did it, any other coach since Tom Osborne has been able to do that. And I think Rule's challenge is getting these guys to play as good as they can. And I don't know that we know he can do that yet because he hasn't had a chance to do it. Right. And it might take a while to, to just. Do you think Solich got that out of out of his players? I don't know. Like I was around for a little bit of it, but not all of it. Well, we were in an era ninety eight, ninety nine, end of an era where a lot of the players were were, were self motivated. A lot of those guys wanted to kick ass because that that's what was expected. Right. It was handed down every year. It was. Do you remember the John Garrison rant after the two thousand two Kansas State game? No, I don't. Well, he kind of went off on you got to want it. They lost 40 to 15 yeah, or whatever they did. That's what I'm talking about. I feel like that for the majority of the solo chair, what they had was a lot of talent, and I don't know that they were getting the most out of their guys. And and maybe they did in 03, but that's in part because they I, added Bo. I, I, think, I feel like they the only coaches that have really done it, other than, than Bo, is Osprey. And Bo did it in a way um, that wasn't helpful. Rule's um, got to be able to do that. But he's got to do it in a way that doesn't burn the program down after seven years. Right. Um, and I think when you add transfers, I think the, the fewer number, the better. Because you you do want to build that culture. You do want these guys to learn to do things on their own. And when you bring in a lot of transfers from other programs, they have to learn. And maybe they fall in line, maybe they don't. But um, I, think, I, I think those are good points. For, you know, for Frank. Was always learning how to be a head coach, and and uh, the staff at first helped him, and then he they stayed too long. And they were at the end, right. you know, all the everything they did for twenty years was hard to do. You know, nine games or nine wins a year, 
it's just, just tough every year you know doing what what they did um they they, they got tired i think at the end and um you know, and also, you know, Frank was taking uh, CEO lessons from uh, 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 David Sokol. Mm-hmm. We were reading a book about a, a Till of the Hun. I mean, yeah. it was that kind of learning how to, you know. It's kind of like you either got it or you don't, in a, in a way. So, but yeah, I think you're right. I think there was a little bit. I think they just, you know, Tom had a way of intimidating and also, um, he motivated because you didn't you didn't want to let him down, um, and he, you know nobody worked harder than him either. But um, I think there's something I think there's something to that, and um, I I feel like Bo got the most out of his guys, but at the end the the, the most wasn't good enough. Well, and again there were things about their program where when they get in a really big game against a team that was equally talented, yeah. they shrunk from the moment. And we, we can go. We don't need to rehash all of that. No. Uh, my only point with Bo is that I'm. Uh, what I'm saying in part is this: there were games in the Frost era, especially, where at the end of it, you're like, "How in the hell did they lose?" Right. They did so much. They were the better team, and you just you go back over it, and you're like, "How in the hell did they lose this game?" And I'm like, at the end of the day, it's kind of what Terrence Knighton said on Monday: it's culture. Like, you have to have the players take over. And I'm not talking about losing to Ohio State in 2021. Right. I'm talking about, you know, just a couple of the games in there where it's like Purdue 2019. You get the lead and you give it back up to a team that wasn't very good. Um, you know, uh, how do you play the way you do in Illinois in the COVID year where you come out and you lay a total egg, you got a quarterback throwing the ball sideways on the first play of the game, mm-hmm. You know, like, what the it's, hell is going on? It is culture. and it's, It is. The head coach, uh, you know, that's it, where it starts. And there are, are different ways to do it. Um, I, don't know, I don't know Brad Bielema. I don't know how he coaches, but he seems to be a, a pretty aggressive guy um, who – I think will, will be fun to play for him. Maybe I, I don't know. Well, I think it would be fun to play for yeah, him, yes. But um, – you know, it's, I don't know if PJ Flex fun to play for, but PJ Flex wins games, right? So and there are moments when I listen to Rule, and I hear a little bit of Fleck, and that's not a knock on either one of them. Right. Like you hear him, and you're kind of like, you're not going to, you're not going to have a boat and oars and all that, but you absolutely believe in some things, and pre- maybe the same way that Fleck does. There's a little preacher there, and I think yes. uh, maybe that's how he builds the culture. Man, there's a, some. Some of some of that is okay. It's hard work, but we're we're going to motivate by right. giving you speech or giving you you know something 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 to chew on every day. Um, and um, can we talk about Iowa for a second? Yeah. I know it's a pick six podcast, yeah, but sure. Iowa's Nebraska's rival. You mentioned you mentioned Ference. Yesterday he has his signing day press conference, and one thing that I think that he does that I like is he has his recruiting coordinator talk too, which I like. And so the recruiting coordinator takes the player questions and Kirk yeah. takes the CEO questions. Good. Part of his part of his press conference yesterday was multiple questions about his son. Right. The offensive coordinator. Kirk says that he anticipates no staff changes going forward, which opens the door for his son to like leave, but it it, it was pretty clear that he doesn't think he's not making any changes himself and he expects his son to be back. Iowa's offense was one of the worst offenses in the history of Big Ten football. It was horrible. Well, what in the world? How, how much of a king do you have to feel like you are to be that to to have the sand to do that? I mean, his 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 spikes and and everything are are so dug in there now. He he he, he can barely walk. I mean, he's he's, he's dug in and he's stubborn and he's. Um, Maybe waiting on this. Maybe they may think this quarterback, uh, the, the Michigan kid. Maybe he can uh, um, exonerate Brian, or maybe okay, we have a quarter. We'll call the same plays. Right. We'll do some of the same things, but we'll have a better quarterback. So uh, then, all, yeah. th- th- then I'll show you. It wasn't really him. So well, it's almost like he's saying K. McNamara, who was recruited and developed yeah. by Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. And he said this. He was he's picking McNamara's brain. 
that this guy is going to become the thing that they needed yeah. because the previous quarterbacks coach, which was not Ference until last year, right. apparently didn't recruit worth a damn. Now, he didn't say that last part, but it's basic, basically he was implicating, well, you know, we're going to bring in this guy, and boy, I tell, you, that guy, I tell you, that offense is pretty good, so we're picking his brain about that offense. I'm like, why don't you if just this, hire Michigan's offensive if, line coach to run your team? If, he's, if Brian is back and this doesn't work, most places would say, okay, you're all out. I think they would say you're all out now. But would Gary Barta do that? No, he no, won't do he that. He didn't do it. Right. So I think it's <laughs> – look, I, th- I really think – It's I'm, just such a contrast. I'm not part of that program. I, I watch it from afar. Yeah. I have appreciation for, for Kirk Ferentz and uh, sort of an understated uh, old-school program that does a lot of things right. Um, but they kind of get in their own way. And – to me, they're not a. They're just not a program that's about a, uh, distractions. They, they let Nebraska come up with all the distractions. Well, they had, some, um, they had the whole but thing. This in is, this is, but this is a distraction, oh, and, yeah. and this is it's uncharacteristic for him to let this get. I've said this before. If Brian, I think Brian should, I, I, I think he should resign. You know, what your old man. I don't know how many more years he has left, but let him enjoy whatever he has left without all the anger. And the people are, are are they're over there pissed about this, and they're looking at the thing the thing differently. Mm-hmm. They're looking at the coach differently. And um, if you're the son, get out of the way. Right. Go go coach somewhere else. I don't know where you can go. You know, th- call Belichick. Go th- go go to the NFL and do something. Um, go go coach offensive line in the NFL. But get the hell out of there and let him enjoy. But they're just so dug in. And it's it's um, it's put, put, it, put now you're right. Maybe he will exit stage left after the Super Bowl. Sometimes jobs open up in the NFL. But um, maybe if they all come back, it puts a lot of pressure on next season. A lot of pressure. Well, the reason I I always try to get out in front, even though I'm you know a puny brain, I try to get out in front of what I think the trend the the, the trends that I believe are true within not only college football, but also in the Big Ten. And so I go back to like 2018, 2017, 2018. Mm. And I remember saying back at the time, and I have to go back and look at the tweets, Wisconsin's plateaued, Purdue's the future. Wisconsin's plateaued, Purdue and Nebraska are the future. Mm -hmm. I wrote a column that was like, Nebraska almost beat Ohio State today, and Purdue did this. This is the future. Right. And there was a Wisconsin radio personality who tweeted something about Nebraska the day they almost beat Ohio State in 2018. And it was like, this is coming. And I was like, you know, Wisconsin, they've plateaued. They're running an old school offense. It's not working very well. Well, it, well kind of never really went down, but they did plateau. And what's interesting to me is that AD fired Paul Christ. He's like, I, you're fired. And not only that, he then hires a coach who brings in a spread coordinator from North Carolina. They are completely changing their program. Mm-hmm. And they're doing it, I think, because they want to compete with Ohio State and Michigan and UCLA and USC. And so they're making this big, massive change. Purdue peaks. Apparently, Jeff Brom and Purdue didn't really get along that well, so he's gone, and now they're kind of starting over. But, but to me, then I look at Iowa, and I'm like, how in the hell has Iowa been able to win these games? Like, how do they do this with their offense being as bad as it is? And I think, here's, what, here's my perspective. I still think I was behind the curve on the transfer portal, and I think they're behind the curve on their, their coordinator. Um, I think they're stubborn, and I think even though, as I think about it, I'm probably going to pick them to be favorites for the Big Ten West, when that league flips, they're in trouble. And they have to start playing teams from the other side. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for Maryland when they don't have to play Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State every year, and Iowa has to play all, those, all three of those teams? Because that doesn't happen now. Just imagine what it's going to be like when that occurs. And from my perspective, I feel like Iowa is, if they don't flip some of this stuff, they're going to be where Wisconsin is right now. Well, their, their fans will pay attention to Wisconsin. They, they, all, they all keep an eye on Nebraska at all times. I know I hear from them. But, um, but Wisconsin, if, Wisconsin if, they, if, if Luke Fickle makes this thing work, 
you know, Iowa and Wisconsin are almost like brothers in some way. They're the, the, the mirror images, uh, you know, and if Wisconsin goes a different route and tries to, uh, and is uh, successful, mm-hmm. now success going forward is what? With, without divisions, what is success? Well, it's, it's, it's not just going to a bowl game, not just going to the Outback Bowl. It's, it's uh, challenging Ohio State at the top. Mm-hmm. If Wisconsin ends up doing that, and you know, being beating USC and with this style, then I was going to pay attention. They're going, okay, this is what we need too. So you think I, you think Wisconsin's a bigger rival for Iowa than Nebraska? I don't know. I think Iowans like to keep an eye on Nebraska. They want they want to make sure that they they keep them down. Right. But yeah, I think um, and, and and maybe if maybe if Scott Frost had made it work, they would have said, well, we need to do that too. Mm-hmm. But I think it's either or. But Nebraska's not going in, in the, the same direction as uh, Wisconsin. They're maybe going back, right, to the a little bit, the, the fullback, the, the running game, yeah, uh, the play action, whatever. Uh, I think the, the fullback the is a little bit of a red meat move. That I think that guy's going right. to be a tight end. But I don't think it's going to be a spread. It's not going to be that. It's going to be um, not a four wide receiver spread. A lot, no, no, but. Tight ends, yes, please, and a, a quarterback who, who runs, I think that's valuable, um, especially if you show it early in this game. Then they have to watch. Then it opens up everything else. But yeah, I, I do. I think um, if Wisconsin makes this work, yeah, I think they will. Um, hmm. But you know, I always has guys over the years who could throw it. They've had good receivers. They've had great receivers. Yeah, they have a great tight end. I think the transfer portal is more transformative than we've given it credit for, even more than we've given it credit for. Because as I was telling an Iowa reporter last year, about an hour after the game, I'm like, the transfer portal decided this game today. Iowa didn't add anybody in the transfer portal in the offseason, and they lost. Right. Because they didn't have any players, and Nebraska has a quarterback and a receiver, and those two guys beat, beat Iowa's elite defense for two quarters, and that was why they won. And so I'm like, this was a transfer portal game. If Iowa doesn't want to get in the transfer portal game, they're gonna they're gonna turn into what Northwestern well, has quickly become. They got the Michigan quarterback. They did. They got, it's they amazing to me that, that they think that's the like they only got like five transfers. Right. It's amazing to me that they feel like this guy and he's a good player yeah. is somehow going to be like yeah, I transformative. Know. I don't know. I don't know if he is or not. Neither um, do I. But you he, know, if he was, he'd still be in Michigan. Um, now, now, Iowa plays 10 conference games a year, as we all know. Yeah. They don't play nine. They play 10 because they play the same team every year in Iowa State. Mm. So it's basically like scouting an extra conference game. They don't play anyone else hard. They rarely do. They, I know they play the national champion South Dakota State team and beat them 9-6 to six or whatever, 7-5. to five. But So we don't really know what Iowa is until late in the season when they either swoon or they do whatever. But once that Big Ten schedule turns... There is going to be a year in there very early in the process where either Nebraska or Iowa or Wisconsin or somebody is going to have to play Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, or Michigan, Ohio State, and USC, and they are going to be smacked with a hammer. Right. Because those te- Iowa's never had to do that. Right. Last year they played Michigan, Ohio State, and they got blown out. Like, if you have to play those two teams and then you have to play USC on top of it, look out. And so I feel like that's going to happen at some point. It's, it it's, might happen to Nebraska. It's coming. Did you know that Nebraska, in 2011 and 2012, when they joined the Big Ten, mm-hmm. they played Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State Absolutely. in the same year? Absolutely. I was yeah. never had – Nebraska had to play way more Ohio that State was, than Iowa did. That was TV talking. It was? It was maybe Jim Dwayne saying, welcome to the club. Oh, Here, no question. Here's your initiation fee. But it was also, it was also, it was also Mark Silverman saying – Okay, we brought you in for this reason. Let's let's show everybody what we got. And Nebraska won nine ga- won nine games in ten games. Yeah. They did okay. They did okay. They managed. The interesting thing to me when that schedule switches, the biggest beneficiary is Maryland, because I think that they probably could have won the Big Ten West this year, mm-hmm. but they are stuck playing Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State every year. Yeah. And the biggest and the the biggest deficiency, in my opinion, is going to be Iowa. I think Iowa is going to get stuck. Playing Michigan and Ohio State more, whereas Nebraska's going to get stuck playing the two West Coast teams more. Well, which I'd love. TV will will tell us to. Uh, Fox will tell us. Uh, they will who they want. But 
Um, think about you know talking about the Wisconsin uh, experiment, whatever you want to call it. Um, did you see how many how how many transfers they they're, they're taking in? Yes, thirteen. Yes, that's okay. That's a telling about the roster they had that he inherited. Things had not been good. That's right. And B, um, the old you know Wisconsin reload you know, into the program, uh, the culture. You know, every year is you know another another will knock out another bowl game. This might sometimes when you put in those people, it's 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 not easy. It, it That's you know right. turnover happens, and That's maybe right. maybe more turnover happens. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Wisconsin's acting like others, and uh, they had that's, to. that's something to keep an eye on. They had to. You and I both watched the last two Nebraska Wisconsin games, yeah, and we both had to switch what we were writing late because we both thought Nebraska might win both of them. They they three uh, and nine uh, and four and eight in Nebraska took whatever those two Wisconsin teams all the way to the wire. It it, it was and maybe another reason why Paul Christ is is not there. Yes. But uh, when you had thirteen transfers, that means you've got holes, and uh, you've got guys who can't play. That's right uh, to that standard. So, um, and that was. The, the quarterback who went to Florida and people in Florida were not happy. So, uh, poor guy. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah. And going forward, we're going to have to almost start over, Sam, in the year with uh, I know divisions. You know, what is success? What are you What are you trying to do here? Mm-hmm. What's the goal? And there will be a, a couple of sections of the Big Ten. One section will say our goal is to go to the playoff. The other section is our goal will be to not finish in the bottom and go to a bowl game. Um, it'll be a haves and have nots. The line will be even clearer than ever without, with, 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 without divisions. Um, and what I'm That's interesting to, that you say that. And I'm anxious okay. to see the, um, the the bottom half. Do they would they stamp pat with that coach they love, or do they fire coach start firing coaches? I think Northwestern's in a real pickle because I think Northwestern's going to be the team that's at the perpetual bottom because of the transfer portal because they can't yeah. bring players in. Right. Um, I, mean, those, I don't. I don't know what's going to happen to Indiana and Maryland. Like Indiana and Maryland have long been in the bottom, but again, you free those teams from having to play. My guess is that what TV will do is TV will say, "Listen, now that we've got UCLA and USC in here, we are going to match them with good teams because we like ratings." And Indiana and Maryland and Rutgers are going to play a lesser schedule, and they're going to win more games as a result. They're going to get Minnesota's schedule. So we'll see. I mean, I, I just— Well, this change mentality. The Big Ten mentality to me is you, you win your rivalry game, the, the, the pig, the axe, the, the bucket, and you go to a bowl game, and, it, man, that was a good year, man. That was— you know, um, what does the playoff do, the expanded playoff, do to that mentality in the Big Ten? Does it change it? I think it changes it. it it'll be interesting to see. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. Nebraska is Nebraska is obviously going to be all in on making the playoff. Yeah. It's not going to be seven seven wins and we're satisfied. I think uh, Matt Rule's got a couple years to do that, but that's it. I, but I think when you're talking about Indiana, maybe, and Maryland, and Rutgers, and um, Northwestern, they're probably you know toward the bottom. Um do they care that much about the playoff? It, I don't know. North, what, I, but, but the middle ones, the Wisconsin's, the Iowa's, Nebraska's, uh, Michigan State, where do they go? Well, we're, we're, we're paying Mel Tucker $9 million. He better go to that playoff at least once. So you start getting into the middle, that's going to be interesting because the Big Ten way is to lock up your coach. We love our culture. We love our guy. And uh, we're going to stick with him. And it's a marathon. Uh, what does the playoff do to that? I think it changes it. Let's talk basketball for a minute. Uh, Nebraska men's basketball lost to Illinois on Tuesday night. Very good game for 30 minutes. Uh, Nebraska was in it, uh, and then they weren't. Um, We don't have to go over the particulars of that game, but they play Penn State on Sunday. Uh, When you think about – I mean, we're getting – we're obviously moving into the wheelhouse here where it's going to be, you know, make a break time uh, for, for Fred. Uh, they have five home games, I think, in February. So this is the opportunity to make some make a move. Um, when you think about, you know, the conversation around that, 
the amount of commitment level to it. What does good commitment look like um, to a basketball program, irrespective of who the coach is? Well, what do you mean? But when you say make a move, what do you mean? I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah. <laughs> irrespective of who but the coach at, is, look at the narrative of this season. We were going from hey Creighton, and they beat Creighton in Iowa. Man, this this guy, he's got it figured out. This team is going to win four or five more games. And maybe they'll press for a postseason. This thing's on the uptick a little bit. You know, I think he's, you know, now all of a sudden the last month of the season, by, because of two injuries to two very good role players, uh, very effective role players on defense who help, you know, establish identity and give you the teeth every game. All of a sudden this last month is going to be, is his job safe? I mean, we've gone from this to that. I, I, um, and I don't, but you're asking about uh, the uh, what, what did you ask about? I, I went off in a different direction there. That what does commitment look commitment. like, irrespective of who the coach is? Commitment is. I've been writing about this for years. I feel like Nebraska has never cared much about basketball. They, right. they they throw money at it. They build them a building. They give the coach money and hire a staff. And but it's like giving your kid. I, I love Dirk's example of this. It's like giving your kid money. Okay, I love you. Here's money. I'm not going to spend any time with you. I'm not going to really show you I care. I'm showing you I care by throwing money at you. So, um, well, I think the, you know Trev is, is in the 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 the, the 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 perfect place to do this uh, because he's the, the all-encompassing uh, Nebraska CEO, the the Husker, the former Husker. Who, who, who knows and values the ways of the, the red um, and wants every program to have the same standard. Um, bring in a basketball guy to be the assistant AD for basketball. Somebody that knows basketball. They have never had that guy. And let him run the program, basically. You're the AD. You're going to be at the games. You're going to know what's going on. Let a basketball guy in and make that the guy, basketball decision. What will that guy do? Um, he'll help hire the coach. He'll give him what he needs. He'll be there all the time. Um, maybe he helps him make personnel decisions. Um, he put out a plan to do what Matt Rule is doing, go to every high school in the state and establish a relationship with every basketball coach. They don't have that. They don't have anything close to that. Um, because there are... Guys coming out of this state in basketball now, it isn't 1991 anymore, although 1993, they had all these guys, uh, Andre Woolridge and, and Eric Strickland, they, pretty good talent. But the it's better high school basketball. The world of you know, amateur basketball is so much more advanced now in Omaha and all these places. There are guys who can help you. There are guys in, in the state who would go to that school and um, – you know, was was Hunter Salas one of them? If Tim Miles, I don't I don't know. I've heard that. I don't know. But you know, Chucky would Chucky have you know? It's but so you got to lock those guys up, and you do that by showing them that we care about basketball. And so, I I just feel like it's it's never been. I think the standard for basketball should be the same as the standard for Nebraska football. And people will cringe. I think Nebraskans have always had a thing where a fear, if we take one ounce of passion away or caring for football, it's going to damage football. We can't, we can't give the same to both. Hell yes, you can, and you should. That's the only chance basketball has here is if you're um, – you're on top of it. You're, you're uh, 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 you know, you're uh, uh, as obsessed with winning with the basketball as you are football, and does, you can, and you can do State, that. Does Kansas State have that? Yes. Does Colorado have that. Yes. Colorado. Colorado. Colorado doesn't care about either one. Right. <laughs> but they win a lot more than Nebraska. They Is that just because Tad Boyle's a good they coach? They got the coach. They got the coach. And his, his mom been, lives out there, so he's agreed to stay yeah, there. <laughs> I know it's a know. odd story, but. I know, and and sometimes you you just you just hit on the right guy, and I can't fault Nebraska for certainly hiring Fred Hoiberg, but Bill Moose didn't know basketball and didn't really care, uh, but he knew it was the right guy to get, and he got him. Um, he 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 was a closer. Um, I I would honestly say that like this is 
uh, there's so many things about Hoiberg as a person I admire. I like the way he goes through his press conferences. I like the way that he thinks about things. Mm-hmm. My goodness, it really is the players. They're not, and I'm not. I'm not going to name one player. They're mm-hmm. not good enough. Well, they have a couple of good players, but then you look at these other teams, and I'm like, how in the hell? Does Colorado, which, I mean, you want to talk about a place where no one would care about basketball, but they manage to have better players every year. How do they do that? How does Nebraska have lesser players than almost than Northwestern, which they do? How does that happen? I don't follow Colorado. I don't know. But with Northwestern, how does that happen? They, um, you just watch the teams play basketball, and you're like, one team's a lot better at basketball than the other. I'm not sure Northwestern's that good. I think Nebraska, Nebraska's been that bad. Right. So, well, it, but it starts with it's the, the it starts with the coaching. It's the coaching, the, the evaluations, the. Uh, but this is year four, and it feels like year one because it does. But it, that's Hoiberg's fault, and he made his bet here. Yeah, he loses two guys, and the thing falls apart. But that's his fault. He made his bet. They didn't have any people. They haven't four years. You should be. I know COVID. I know, but you should, everybody's had that. You you've got to you've got to build it up. You've got to, and 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 they had they changed in in midstream because he he misjudged the Big Ten, and as an AD as a basketball AD, you know you know going in okay we need a certain kind of coach to come in, and okay well, when you, before you hire Hoiberg, what are you going to do? How are you going to recruit? What's your, you know, how are you going to play in the Big Ten? I don't, I don't want to. And people on this podcast probably hate it when we bring up Creighton, but I'm going to, I'm going to use Creighton as an example. No names on Nebraska, but I will use a name with Creighton. Fred King, who is a backup center for Creighton, mm-hmm. is a better post player than either one of Nebraska's backup post players. Oh, not even Both close. of whom have been in college. Not even close. For way longer than Fred King. Yeah, it's, it's, what, what is Greg McDermott do well, to be uh, able to know that that – now, you, when centers come, you know this. You don't really know what centers are going to be like when they get there. And yet he does because he goes out and he gets Fred King. And he, Fred King's a good backup center. He's going to be a good him, starting center. But they got him late last year. He's he's at the NBA Academy. That's right. They got he's him a, in like June. So he can play. Um, they, I don't know. I don't know how. I have not asked Mac how that went about, went down. But, but I'll, I'll obviously, I, they obviously backups. heard that he was become he became becoming available. I think he might have committed somewhere else, he and, was. and then he decommitted. Yes. Um, so he becomes available. They needed the backup guy. They've got all this talent. He can go to them and goes and say, "I've sent guys to the NBA." You can come here and, and play a couple of years and develop. You're going to play the Big East. You'll be on TV. Here's, here's our style. Um, and, and they can say all that because they've done it our every former, year. Our former boss, Thad Livingston, and I mm-hmm. sat in a room in, in, in Tim Miles' office. And I was in there because I wrote something about another recruit and Miles was mad or whatever. We sat in Tim Miles' office. This is many years ago. And Thad knows basketball. You know he does. I mean, he knows it better than anybody. And he sits in that office with Tim Miles and me, and we're just sitting there, and we're talking about basketball, and he goes, I got a name for you. And he goes, Kyrie Thomas. That's what he says, Kyrie Thomas. And he goes, Taz. That's what everybody calls him. And obviously Thad knows Taz. Nebraska never recruited him. He goes to Creighton, and he's the Big East Defensive Player of the Year. How in the world does Nebraska continue to not be able to get good basketball players in their program? Well, you tell me. I mean, is, is, was Tim Miles arrogant? Was I don't just know. not smart enough to figure this out? I mean, um, he got Isaiah Roby. That was a good one. But, like, I just – they don't have enough good basketball players down there right now. I don't know. I mean, but um, – I'm, I'm not trying to fluff up Creighton here either. But the guy knows – he knows how to do something. Greg Marshall is a – was run out of Wichita State. He was an abusive coach. There are a lot of things wrong with him. There's a reason he doesn't have a job yet. I don't think he has a job yet. No. But that man won games. He had players, too. And player, he had players. He player, had Fred Van Vliet. Players win games. Um, I just don't know. Sam, I, I, I wish I could tell you I don't know why, but I don't think Tim Miles was really ingrained in Omaha. Right. Um, he knew how to entertain people in Omaha. He spoke many times. But, again, 
you've got Nebraska. Nobody knows Nebraska basketball in Omaha. Nobody knows about him. Nobody knows right. anything about him. They need a basketball AD to kind of That's what reintroduce. I'm saying. And I, I would throw out the name. <laughs> People will laugh, but I, you never know till you ask. Um, you should go get Bruce Rasmussen to be the basketball AD. Yeah, I don't think he'd do that. Why not? You know. He's not Creighton. He's well. Not, yeah. There's nobody at Creighton he knows anymore except the head coach. Yeah. You don't think he? I don't. I'm just saying. I don't, I don't we ask. What about Darren Hanson? Well, yeah. I mean, I think Darren's going to be good on TV. That's what I think he's going to be. Yeah, that's at. true. Um, I don't think Darren and Trev really talked much on you and no. Yeah, that's, Trev's got to prove himself as a basketball guy. Um, and that the reputation is that Trev's a football guy. And he is. Yeah, I think he's made he some is. good football And moves. a hockey guy. And he took care of Frost after two, three games. We're, just, we're, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> right. Basketball, well, I mean, okay. So how much do you care about basketball? And I think I, I, want, I think Fred, should, you know, every coach should probably get four or five years. But he, you got to earn that fifth year. And I'm not sure by the first four years if he's done that. Um, I think and the COVID thing was hurt, um, and I think now he, I think he now understands the way to play in the Big Ten. But you look at what they, what would they bring back next year? It would look like a wasted year unless you go to the portal because they don't have anybody. They're going to have Juwan Gary back and a couple of these other guys. Um, but like you said, they don't have nearly enough guys who can play. Um, so you'd have to go to the portal and really get lucky, really hit on it. And so then it's a program that every year you're just. You're trying to roll the dice every year. That's not a basketball program. That's not a winning basketball program. So uh, at some point, Trevor asks, what does basketball mean to me? And um, I need to go out and find a guy and, and restructure our basketball program with somebody in charge and then a head coach. who They, they get along. They have the same vision. And then they, they go make it work. Um, and then, you know, that's eventually going to have to happen. I don't see this. This right. is not going to end. This There's is not, just so many things that you, you, eventually they, this is not going to work out. It's just a matter of will it be this year or will, is it going to be next year? Interesting. But if it's next year, I mean, what kind of message do you send? If, if you finish 12 and 19 or 13 and whatever, what kind of message do you send your fans? If, if, if you, you know, it's just tough because I love, we all like Fred. And, and I, I, I thought this would be a great story. It'd be, it'd be fun to – he does care about Nebraska. But this isn't just about Fred Hoiberg caring about Nebraska. It's about what do you want to be as a basketball program, you know. Um, and so I think, you know, we talked about Iowa football. Iowa basketball is – I mean, the, the, guy's a, I mean the guy's a madman over there. But Iowa basketball, Iowa cares about basketball. They do. They have run guys out. Of course, yeah. Nebraska's run guys out too. But Iowa seems to really – they have a good tradition. You can do that. Nebraska can be Iowa. Absolutely, they can be the same thing. Well, it'd help if you, you got to care. Chris and Keegan Murray growing up in Cedar well, Rapids. <laughs> you have connections, but you can get. I mean, you can you can get players in Nebraska. Sure. They've gotten players. Yeah, but um, but they did. They got Luca. Uh, what, what, how do you say his last? I can't even remember. My brain's frozen. Right, but look, but look at the kids from Omaha. You, you you get to Lincoln. Yeah, of course you you're, you're fighting Creighton, but Creighton doesn't get all of them. No. Um, Again, Hunter Savalos right now playing nine minutes a game. Uh, doesn't get it. Doesn't score much. Doesn't do much. You know, I always thought, well, he shouldn't go to Nebraska because there'd be too much expected, and he wouldn't be able to. And it would just that he should go somewhere where we can blend in. But that's not working out either. To me, if, I mean, maybe he loves it. Maybe maybe it is working out. But um, you know, if he had a guy like that, he had Chucky. Just you know, I just feel like. It's nobody knows about Nebraska basketball. Nobody in the state. Nobody really, uh, you know. And it was, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know Fred. I don't know Fred Hoiberg's calendar or so, you know. But it doesn't appear to me he does a lot of. He, he makes a lot of appearances and does a lot of things either. So uh, visibility is a big thing in that. When you're in Nebraska basketball and you're the in the shadow, you got to do more. Right. And they haven't done. They've never done more. Okay. That is our Pick 6 podcast for this week. By the time we talk next week, I think Nebraska will have played two games. 
Um, they play Sunday against Penn State, and I think they go to Michigan. Or never had a lot of luck at Michigan, um, so we'll see what they do there. And, this is the uh, Michigan team that they could have beaten with oh, all, yeah. all their healthy guys, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, but they don't have the healthy guys. So. They don't. Um, so we'll see what Nebraska does there. Nebraska women play tonight, and then I think they play early next week as well. Um, we will talk a little bit more about Husker football next week. We'll have uh, lots to chat about then. For Tom, I'm Sam. Dirk will be back next week. This is the Pick 6 Podcast.